Hello, so today I have with me Carola Beresford Cook, who if anybody is a Shatsu student or practitioner, you've probably heard of her because she's written one of our most important textbooks on Shatsu. And Carola is also an acupuncturist as well. Not all Shatsu practitioners are acupuncturists. And today I wanted to have her in to talk about essentially why Chinese medicine is still relevant and important for us today. And perhaps we'll touch a bit on the extraordinary vessels as well. Um, this textbook I have, she, she wrote the textbook in the 1990s, or it was published in the 1990s, and I'd already finished my Shatsu studies by then, so I didn't use it as much, but it's become a really important part of, of Shatsu practice. But other than that, I think I'd like Carola to introduce herself um, and say anything that she would like to talk to say. Right. Um, yes. Uh, hi. Well, I, I yes, I did indeed write that book in 1996. I was very lucky to be invited to um, write a textbook. It's always good to be in on the beginnings of things, I think. And uh, yes, I was in the right place at the right time. So I was very lucky to have the chance. And um, yes, it has been translated into a few languages now, six or seven. And I'm very grateful that it does continue to have some value to Shiatsu students. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm retired now, but uh, my life, I would say, has been very much colored by my study of TCM, which has been TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. And although Shiatsu is a Japanese culture, comes from Japanese culture, and is a Japanese therapy, very uniquely Japanese in many ways, lots of people are unaware of the fact that Japanese culture has been deeply linked with Chinese culture for much of its early history. Although, obviously, in more recent years, the two cultures have diverged quite a lot. But um, Chinese medicine has influenced Japanese medicine quite, quite a lot. And so the study of Chinese medicine is something that many shiatsu practitioners um, engage in during their training. And it's very, very helpful in helping our patients, helping our clients with their problems. Wouldn't you agree, Suzanne? Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's great that you made that point. In fact, I was thinking about things I missed out in my initial in presentation of you is that, yes, Shiatsu comes from Japan, but it's really important to recognize how much Japan and China were, with Japan was so influenced by China and that tradition, we call it traditional Chinese medicine. I also... I'm aware that it was as influenced. There's a lots of influences from other neighboring countries like India and Tibet. There's lots of um, it was a melting point of of exchange. So it's in a way it's a bit of an an incorrect term, isn't it? Traditional Chinese medicine it encompasses quite a broad spectrum. It's such a big spectrum of medicine and different traditions. And I almost think that medicine isn't either the right way of describing it because it's actually much more than what we might think of as medicine for me it's a whole way of life a whole philosophy a whole way of being absolutely it is everything from the exercise that you take to how you breathe to um how you how you walk <laughs> yes what you eat even you know affairs of the bedroom as they quickly call it <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, what attracted you? We didn't talk about what attracted you to it. I know some of your story. And I also know we actually started from similar beginnings in that you studied languages and then you did massage and then you got drawn to Chinese medicine. Maybe maybe it would help people understand why Chinese medicine, what well, we're calling it TCM for now, what drew you to it in the first place? Well, I think I had a bit of a head start in that I grew up in the Far East. So my family lived in uh, Malaysia and Singapore and briefly in Indonesia as well. 
and um, and so I was like familiar with the with the different culture and very much drawn to it. Mm-hmm. And and also I've always my father was a Western doctor, and um, I never quite gelled with his interpretations of things and the very sort of medicalized view that he took of the body. I could I knew that it wasn't the whole story. Yeah. So, yes, I was just drawn to, I always knew I wanted to do shiatsu as soon as I heard about it. Right. I mean, the idea of acupuncture was fascinating, but it involved needles, which, you know, doesn't appeal to a young girl, really. Yes. And, <laughs> and it's always seemed to me, actually, that needles are um, the least important part of acupuncture, that really what's important is the intent with which you find the place Mm. And the the way in which you connect with your receiver, your client, that's always seemed to be the most important part of acupuncture. And that I learned from Shiatsu, really. And it used to be that way in ancient China, that people would have to learn to palpate the body for three years. They would learn something like Shiatsu before they were allowed to stick a needle in. Yes. Because of the the sensitivity that you get. Mm. so yes so I always you know as soon as I knew that there was a form of acupuncture that you could do without needles I thought that's for me that's where I'm going and uh, it was a while before it arrived in the UK and the minute I knew about it the first time I saw an ad for it in my local health shop it was like zoom (laughs) off I went it never stopped yeah yeah no that's great and I think that's an important point that people forget that in tra- traditional acupuncturists wouldn't just be working with needles, would they? They'd be palpating the body a lot more than many modern acupuncturists do. I hadn't realised they did three years training in palpation before they even touched needles. And needles is, like you say, it's just part of it. But the the most important is how we touch and, and our relationship with our, our client. Absolutely, yes. Well, um, I mean, the, the, the four methods of diagnosis, as I recall, Setsu Shin is um, looking, listening, interrogating and feeling, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And feeling used to be feeling the whole body. But then when um, when Chinese, Chinese culture became a little bit prim <laughs> in the Victorian era and um, uh, ladies particularly would not like to be touched all over. So um, that was when they got this beautiful little ivory dolls. Have you ever seen any oh, little I ivory dolls? Yes, I little creatures, these lovely little nude ivory ladies with tiny feet with shoes on and... Um, and and so the, the, the woman would coyly point on one of these dolls to where the problem was. But then the doctor would only be allowed to take the pulse. So that was the feeling. That was what it became. So just taking uh-huh. the pulse. Yes. And that explains so many of the different, like we said at the beginning, Chinese medicine has evolved over such long periods of time that, of course, it's had different different aspects of it. We, d- we wouldn't see as so relevant now, like showing a client a doll to show us where they could touch. But it's interesting to know some of that that history. And what would you say, do you want to explore some of the things that you feel are most relevant still today from Chinese medicine? Why you, I like the bit that you said your father was a medical doctor and you felt that was only part of the story of the body. So what bits do you feel... TCM well, addresses that modern, that the more medical tradition, uh, sorry, a more Western medical model misses out. Well, every time you open a weekend Sunday supplement, or every time, I mean, for me, maybe because the, the algorithm knows I'm interested in health, but um, for a lot of people, you turn on your computer and you get offered lots of um, possibilities of looking at the way the mind influences the body, for example, you know, could stress be damaging your health, for example, or um, how to change, how to change the way you feel um, in six easy ways, that sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think people these days are much more interested in um working with their um, instincts and with control 
people, you know, in this era of freedom and individualism, working with knowing how to actually control and balance ourselves has become very important. And um, one of the one of the aspects of uh, TCN is that it makes no distinction between your body and your psychology. Mm. It's all part of the same thing. You know, you've got a meridian that governs um, the digestive process and the, you know, the processing of our food, the transforming, the working with the food. And it's analogous. It's the same meridian as deals with over processing things that happen to us are in our um, um, worrying, worrying about things, chewing things over, trying to digest our experiences. It's all in the language, you know. Yes. So. Whereas Western medicine is very much, um, it's very vague about things. It talks about stress, you know, mm. but we have different kinds of stress. We've got the stress of having to constantly make decisions and plan. So that'll go with the liver meridian, which has to do that in the physical body. And we have um, the stress of anxiety and fear, which will go with the kidneys and the adrenal glands. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's, very specific about the type of stress yes. so this is very relevant to us yeah and um something else i was thinking about today i just heard something about rewilding on the radio there's so much now about um it's good for us to be in nature mm. and yet most people live in cities find mm. it very hard to be in nature we're surrounded by very unnatural environments mm. whereas tcn is actually based in nature the mm. laws that it follows are the laws of our relationship with the planet and with everything in it with the seasons mm. our circadian rhythm our monthly cycles all of these things are part of nature and yet modern medicine doesn't understand them yes at all it'll recognize them it won't understand them you know the word lunatic when there's a full moon you know it's going to do things to you yeah. Yeah. and 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 what what tcm is doing what shiatsu and acupuncture are doing is in a sense bringing nature in reconnecting us literally through these lines meridians which are um so dissed you know really people kind of say uh, these pathways of so-called life energy well mm -hmm. actually there are pathways there are pathways um which have been discovered that are facial planes they follow particular lines there are there are lines that um occur and that surgeons want not to cut along langer's lines etc there's mm -hmm. all sorts of lines within the body mm -hmm. and it so happens that there are these pathways which link us um through uh through this life energy which uh is so looked down on mm. but it they, they actually they carry information and they link us to the natural world and mm. its laws and so it they can actually be stimulated brought brought in nature brought into us our seasons internally balanced mm. which we need we yeah. need nature and it comes in. I love the way that you describe that, because that's one of the things that really drew me to Shiatsu and to, to Chinese medicine is it is all that we are part of the whole. And I think anybody living today can actually see that. And it's talked about and written about, about, you know, how lunatics you said, but, but also in the winter, we feel different than we do in the summer. Um, and, you know, the amount of light and the circadian rhythms and actually discovering the importance of the circadian rhythms is relatively recent in modern medicine. But the ancient Chinese had specific vessels that are about, well, the 12 meridians are based on the circadian rhythms. But they also understood through some of the other vessels that our eyes are really important organs for regulating the circadian rhythms. And, and I feel that that's, a, that's an aspect for me. But I love the way that you described it about how connecting with these energy lines which have been shown to exist on many different levels for me one of the ways I explain it to people is often when we look at how we developed in utero we can actually see very clearly how these meridian lines develop but I love your idea that by connecting with them we actually bring that element of nature 
into our body and and in our trainings we can we can include or we work with our clients visualizations getting them to connect more especially as you say so many people are living in cities and don't spend really enough time in the countryside and and especially with all you know rewilding and how our natural environment is being destroyed chinese medicine actually addresses that doesn't it by helping us to reconnect more because people talk about rewilding the land but also rewilding ourselves and and chinese medicine for me offers a very tangible tools to help us to rewild ourselves to be more become more connected with our environment absolutely yes and and i mean when you think about how we shop for our food in a city you know, and we have so little time, we're busy, you know, it's really easy to go to a supermarket and choose a ready meal. But when you do that, it's been messed about with so much, it's no longer a natural substance. Mm -hmm. The body has a hard time recognizing it. There's a sort of a kind of a chronic malnutrition. Mm -hmm. I know what I know what else I was going to say about um, the uh, how TCM is relevant to us today mm -hmm. is um, Shizuto Masunaga, who was a well-known um, shiatsu master of the 20th century, talked about how the majority of people in develop, the developed world are half healthy. They're not exactly sick. Mm. They're half healthy. And I think we all know what that means. It's like you're pretty good on the whole, but, you know, you've got this tooth abscess that keeps coming back or, you know, your knees hurt mm. or else you've got a bit of a discharge or you know, you're deaf in one ear or whatever. You know, there's lots of everything, all these things that can go wrong with us. And really, there isn't an awful lot that modern medicine can do for us. Mm. If I break my leg or I get sepsis, I want modern medicine, no doubt about it. <laughs> but if I'm half healthy, I don't necessarily want to go and be offered antibiotics if there isn't an infection. Or, or I don't want to be given anti-inflammatories. You know, I want to find a way that this thing isn't going to come back and not just be suppressed. Yeah. So, and I think that's where, you know, lifestyle is so important in TCM. Yeah. Really, as we said at the beginning, didn't we? Mm -hmm. The way you move, mm -hmm. how much exercise you get, how you, you know, how much natural light you get, mm -hmm. how you breathe, all these things. Yeah. And and because we in our training as shiatsu practitioners, we do a lot of this, don't we? We learn about how to eat. We learn about qigong, for example, which is guided movement and breathing. We learn about, um, yeah, how to breathe ourselves as well. Yeah. All these things, maybe some basic herbs. And we learn so much about diet. Mm -hmm. Foods that are good for the blood, foods that are good for your or specific organs, foods that are going to tonify your energy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's complete. That's why, like you say, it's medicine. It's so much. It's not a really medicine in the way that we tend to think of medicine now. It's more lifestyle, isn't it? Because because. We were always told, I don't know how true you think this is, that, that at some points in Chinese medical history, the practitioner was only paid when their client was healthy, because it is more about supporting us to be one as, as fully healthy as we can and not only half healthy. And the only way we can really do that is by focusing on all these different areas that you've just mentioned, our breath, our movement. But all that, and then in Chinese medicine, we talk about that as the air key. It's not just how we breathe; it's it's the whole atmosphere where we are in the world. And then it's also, but it's not just um, the environment; it's the people, uh, the, the people that we surround ourselves with as well. We talked a lot about nature, but it's also the type of people and the, the how we're relating to them and how that affects our energy. Which in modern psychology, they, we talk about that quite a lot. And then also the the food, as you say, that's such an important part, and and that totally affects our whole well being. And so it's it's really addressing all the levels that we could think of as our whole lifestyle. I mean, we we didn't specifically, I suppose, want to talk about a more 
spiritual aspect because we wanted to, to I, we, we, we wanted we, we said that sometimes people think it's all a bit woo woo but it isn't really it's actually very practical and very tangible and I don't know if you want to say something I bit. think it, well I think it's both yes I do think it's both and um, I do think that people these days have an increasing need for the spiritual aspect mm. but the whole sensible oriental view is that if your body is imbalanced or your hormones are imbalanced then your spirit will not be calm <laughs> or able to develop yeah isn't it right yeah. so there is very much a spiritual aspect and each of the organs as well as an emotion it will have a spiritual quality as well yeah and um and the aim is to allow the person to be calm enough in their body and their activity and, ba and balanced enough mm -hmm. that they're able really more to turn to be aware mm -hmm. i would say to be aware and able to encourage these spiritual values in themselves because it's certainly not about chanting om and doing mm -hmm. a namaste and waving a crystal around is it it's much yeah. more than that because it's linked yeah. to all those levels like you say you've got the, the connection with nature the connection with your physical body through breath through what you eat and all of that helps support your your mind your spirit and how you interpret things and and your your values in life and it's all interconnected you can't really separate out um i mean when I'd you, love you i'd love you to say more about um about the people that surround us, how, how much they influence us. And while I know it's true, I'm thinking, you know, would you, would you, would you just elaborate on that a little bit? Ah, oh, um, I mean, you talked about the different sources of stress in our lives and that they, they can have different- um, Mainly people. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we didn't talk about people. You talked about how different organs, if it's through fear, then it's more related to the yeah. kids, things like that. But there are different, but stress can be also the people that we're with, that with certain people, we can, it can bring up different types of responses with some people, we feel much more at home in our body, much more comfortable, much more grounded, much more earthed. With some people, we do feel more of that anxiety and stress and our kidneys becoming overactive, our whole adrenal nervous system, we don't feel safe with people so that that's what i mean about different relationships with people how and much, how much the the emotions are a cause of disease yes yeah and so the people in our environment as well as nature affects us but yes, the people yes, who I see. around I see. us that's that, that's what i mean and uh, i mean with my work as you know i've i've done a lot with um i started a lot with working with pregnancy and how the mother, we know now so much more about how the mother, how the mother is emotionally feeling and communicating with her baby while her baby's in the womb directly influences that baby on some level for the rest of their, their lives. So if their mother was happy and well in her body and feeling able to love herself and her baby, the baby will develop in a quite a different way than if the mother was always anxious or stressed and then that's going to affect the baby as well and the Chinese uh, Freud didn't believe that the baby will, had any sense of awareness and um, it, only recently the whole field of prenatal psychology has you know in the last 40-50 years people have become aware how much a baby learns when they're in the womb and language uh, all sorts of things but the baby is very aware the baby's brain isn't developed in the same way obviously as an adult's brain and that's why they thought babies weren't influenced so much but they are and I also find that even within Chinese medicine they talk about that they talk about fetal education womb education and how important it is to support the mother so that she can support the baby so you asked me to talk about relationships but I, I think it's important to talk about our first relationship uh, because that does influence the nature of all the rest of our relationships I, I, I don't know what you feel about that yes yes no I agree in fact when you were talking about how certain people make us feel I was thinking about how I tend to have a default setting about how I feel <laughs> around <laughs> most people. 
which is probably, you know, related to one of my organs. In fact, I probably know what it is, but that's not about, it's not about me. But if, 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 for example, we've got a, a liver imbalance, then um, being around people is, is mostly going to trigger our anger and our irritability. We'll get irritable, irritable yeah. with a lot of people, won't yeah. we? Yeah. So we need our liver to be soothed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's if, what we, if, if we've got a, a lung imbalance, then probably we're going to be quite sort of aloof and cut off from people. And uh, yeah. 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 I mean, it is a whole. You can apply it to a whole psychology of different of people's behaviour, can't you? And the kind of people that you're drawn. Yeah and not drawn to that you feel and that different people bring up different responses in us through their own yes. way of being well yeah exactly and I'm glad you brought it back to that because I was thinking there I went I went perilously close to <laughs> something that um, beginning shiatsu students always sort of grasp onto like sort of a life raft you know sort of like the liver is about anger and the lung is about being aloof and cut off which of course it's much more complex than yeah. that and our, our emotions are much more complex than that and I went a bit close there yeah so no I think I, you're right we what can... I meant what I think what I meant to say was that we do have a default setting about how we react to other people because a lot of it's our own projection outwards onto them, isn't it? Yeah. And you were kind of corroborating that. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned about the different types of anger because um, that I've there's I've got a book, I think it's called the seven types of oh no, I did a course recently with a with a Jap with a, an acupuncturist in the States. Jeffrey Yuan, whose work I really like, and we were doing about the seven different types of heart pain. There's different types of heart pain. There's different types of liver pain. There's different types of anger. There's different types of love. So yes, when the, the students first start learning, they think, oh, anger's liver. But every organ has an aspect of anger. It's just a different expression than the expression of liver. So it's much more rich and multi-layered. And sometimes yes. people simplify it and that's why I think that sometimes people think oh TCM it's a bit simplistic completely the opposite I would say mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. all my I've been studying it and learning about it for years and I still discover things about the liver and the spiritual aspect mm -hmm. of the hun and, and it's it it's yes it's it's rich it's rich because as human beings we're complex and we're rich and we're constantly changing. Our environment is constantly changing. Our environment is so different from that of ancient China, but the basic precepts are still relevant. Like the moon is still there. The sun is still there. The seasons are still there. Our connection or not with nature, even though we have transformed nature, the basic fundamentals are, are still relevant, aren't they? What we eat, how we breathe, all of that. Yes. Fortunately, fortunately, did you do you want to say? I mean, we could talk about TCM forever, and I mean, we wanted to talk about the extraordinary vessels as well, didn't we? Because a lot of people are aware there's been a lot written about the twelve meridians of Chinese medicine, and I know in in your book um, you focus more. At, it's what Shatsu practitioners and, and indeed most acupuncturists learn first more about the twelve meridians, which relate to the 24 hour cycle the circadian cycle and we've been talking about them quite a lot liver heart um kidneys spleen you talked about but you didn't say it was spleen um but um, <laughs> and i and, but there's a, a more underlying system of they're called vessels because they're so powerful and that's what i've been working with quite a lot over the years and you've gradually got more interested in those as well and I, I'm quite interested in your perspective on what these vessels are they're called the extraordinary vessels and they're more fundamental um, because they're more about the, the energies that we get at the moment of conception so it's our ancestral energies yes because that's a part that we haven't talked about have we how are we affected by our ancestors by our our genes by our genetics that's right. Yes. I mean, I, I have always found the concept of essence to be extraordinarily powerful. The idea that we inherit this sort of package, our genetic inheritance from our parents, 
and that it gradually declines during our lifetime. And um, the extraordinary vessels are, in a sense, a manifestation of that essence, aren't they? I mean, there was, they are energy, but they are also very much related to our physical development, aren't they? Yeah. So much, particularly embryologically, the different stages that happen in the embryo. And although I know that there's more to it, I've always been struck by the image of the first time the cell, the unified cell, the, um, what do you call it, the ovum that's just been fertilized. Um, oh. Before it's a blastocyst. Yeah, it zygote, I think. the zygote. The zygote. The zygote. zygote. That's yeah. it. And the first time, it's it, there it is for one split second, split nanosecond. It's this sort of perfect, mm. unified whole of male and female individual, indivisible. And then it splits mm. the first time. Mm. And, you know, the legend is, and I, you probably know more than me about the reality of it, but the legend is that, that it's at that moment that our central channel is formed. Mm. So for me discovering the extraordinary vessels began really with discovering my central my own central channel which i discovered through qigong in fact and that very much as a a reality something in the way that the movements brought my awareness into the center and then i became obsessed with the central channel which of course is like in chinese medicine is three mm -hmm. separate channels um but, but you see, the Tibetans have this idea of three channels as well. Um, but the Indians have, oh, yeah, and the Indians also yeah. have the three. Yeah. They? they have the Sushumna, the Ida, and the Pingala, yeah. all yeah. of them. So, uh, but for me, it was just like this central feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I became completely obsessed with it and sort of looking at it, the way all the glands are distributed along it and all the bones the nervous systems starts from there and this you know the main um, blood vessels are there and the, the support of the skeletal system is there mm -hmm. and um, I began working with working outwards from it at that point mm -hmm. and uh, then discovering the other vessels but I was very excited also um, by discovering the girdle vessel, which is my absolute favorite. I love it. I love it. And um, because I also love the triple heater, the triple heater is my favorite marine <laughs> all because it's so complex and there's so much that yeah. it does. Um, and it's very much related with these um, uh, horizontal bands of fascia in our bodies. Um, which and whereas all the other meridians tend to be longitudinal between heaven and earth following the direction of gravity up and down but then we've got these cutoff points which of course are also the um they're also in yoga as being the bandhas and um and the daimai the, the girdle vessel is very much related to them isn't it yeah yeah, I don't maybe, know. Maybe, maybe in somebody who feels like I'm perpetually on a skew. <laughs> <laughs> for, me, for me, the daimai is so leveling and balancing, bringing everything back together and sort of sorting out me, me horizontal facial planes that yeah. I love it. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. And I think you, you said so much in what you just said, but how this central line, which in... Um, in TCM is is conception vessel and governing vessel, but also the third, the penetrating vessel, and how that so much relates to Tibet and Indian medicine and the chakras and everything. And it and it and it is that central channel is so important. But what the, I I don't know in the other systems, but I've never heard it expressed through yoga of more a horizontal channel. And that's what you were talking about with the girdle vessel. And that's what I. That's why, for me also, I love the girdle vessel. I go through phases of which of the extraordinary vessels do I love the most. And it's hard to separate them because they all work together. But, of course, as you described, you need a horizontal plane to balance the vertical. And you've got horizontal lines in the body as well. And the, the, the amazing thing about girdle vessel is it is a girdle, 
in our centre. So it is really very much the girdle, the centre, um, going through our perineum, our pelvic floor. And it's and, and you talked about the diaphragms. The top part of it are the ribs and our, our actual diaphragm. But also in Chinese medicine, they talk about how, because it's the centre, it regulates what's above it and below it. So it does also, like the central channel, it has connections with the whole of the body, not just with the Absolutely. pelvic area. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anything on the horizontal. Mm. I mean, to, to some extent, we've got horizontal planes, haven't we, in our in our knees, in, in, in our joints, basically, all together. You know, there's a yeah. horizontal plane here and... I believe there's even one inside the skull, mm. the tentorium. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so we do have horizontal planes, and uh, and it's very important to release them so that we get flow in mm. all the other meridians, and yet we also need them mm. because, like, you know how you when you shake out a duvet, if it hasn't got horizontal bands, then all the down goes to the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> you need the horizontal bands to keep all the water and um substances sort of from from all just dropping down in, in response to gravity yeah and that's why with just working with the 12 channels or even the the other extraordinary vessels it's not enough is it i feel in most sessions when i work or, or also when i'm teaching movement practices or breath i do try and include some awareness of the horizontal of, of the girdle vessel in fact of the horizontal planes because it's important for people to, to connect with that as well like you said like like if we're a duvet shaking us out properly and getting everything flowing we need to work the horizontal planes as well as the vertical planes yeah that's a great way of describing it I'll always think of your duvet image now yeah <laughs> well most most duvets have horizontal planes now we've, yeah. we've, had, yeah. we've evolved yeah. <laughs> our duvet making yeah um, because I was also thinking, what was I saying? Oh, yes, because the thing with the extraordinary vessels, you've talked about essence and ancestral connections and the beginnings, but within the 12 meridian system, there's not a meridian. I mean, they all affect our brain, but there's not as such a brain meridian. And that's that's also being regulated by the extraordinary vessels. Well, obviously it's on the midline, the brain. Um but also it links in with our our reproductive, our sexual organs as well, which again are touched by the 12 meridians, but there's not a one meridian that regulates our reproductive organs, which I like to call the palaces now, because in Chinese medicine, they talk about the palaces of essence. You already mentioned mm. essence. So our mm. palaces. Um, I mean, we, we would, there's so much more we could say about the extraordinary vessels, but I thought in today's conversation to perhaps talk about them in terms of aging. Because, because I've been complaining about <laughs> aging. <laughs> well, we're both uh, growing older and um, there's a lot of talk about the menopause, but there's not so much talk about post-menopause and even aging and getting older. And yeah, I'll hand it over to you because we had quite an interesting pre-chat about this and I thought it was, it was interesting some of the things you said to share about right. life um, ageing and the changes in essence and, and acceptance of those changes. Right. So, well, um, one, of the, one of the concepts of Chinese medicine, which isn't very very widely distributed. I mean, I have heard it from a reputable source, but I never heard it again. But I latched onto it because it seemed so very important, is the idea of gateways of change. Mm -hmm. So all the times when our hormones are most active are called gateways of change. And they are meant to be periods when um, you can alter your whole constitution, your whole genetic inheritance can improve or degenerate. So, um, and that would be why our clients often say to us, you know, oh, well, I started this problem when I was pregnant, or, oh, I used to have this problem after my first pregnancy, but after my second pregnancy, it all went away and it was marvelous. Mm. Don't, I mean, that happens so much. Yes. But anyway, they gateways of change, literally, you go through them and you have the potential for change. So, obviously, um, birth is one of them and the parent natal period and then there's puberty is a huge one and then there's the onset of sexual activity which the Chinese call marriage 
<laughs> but um, probably happens when you're up. Yes. Um, all, all the all the emotional um, angst, I would think, of of your of, of your sexual uh, first sexual engagements, and then every pregnancy. But I mean, that's it for men; they don't have another one. Mm -hmm. And then um, for women, every pregnancy is another gateway of change. And then the last one is the menopause. Mm -hmm. So the feeling of going through the menopause is like now where. <laughs> <laughs> and um yes it can be quite depressing <laughs> you know it's like where, where am i going where's the next gateway oops not that one <laughs> um so yes and you do get the feeling of your your reproductive life has finished and, and uh, you do begin to feel the loss of your essence i feel Mm. Listen, when I say you, I'm saying me, really, because mm. I only have my own perspective on it, really. Mm. But, um, you know, libido does not go. Mm. But but the feeling of capacity <laughs> to yeah. satisfy it does, does go. I mean, for example, you know, uh, uh, painful intercourse becomes really a big problem. There are so many obstacles to full enjoyment of your life your physical life because the essence is declining and there's no two ways about it what we were talking about pre-recording in the chat was um how you know you can have all, all the bodybuilding you like and um, all the monkey glands you like and all the face lifts you like but it ain't going to make you young. <laughs> There's no way. You have to accept it. And there is a kind of time when you just kind of go, okay, bring it on. Mm. <laughs> and what's really meant to happen, I think, in the philosophy of Chinese medicine is that the physical attributes of the different meridians are transformed into the spiritual qualities and wisdoms of the meridians. So, um, you know, you lose your essence, but you acquire the wisdom. You exchange the physical ability for the um, spiritual ability, if you like. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't come easy. And I feel that part of the actual process of transformation into wisdom is the actual wrestling with the disability. Mm -hmm. So I think that was something about what I was saying before, that there is suffering in aging, that there is distress mm -hmm. and you have to encounter it and you have to deal with it somehow. Mm -hmm. And that that is what produces the um, uh, the spiritual quality. You hope. Mm -hmm. I still get quite depressed about it. But anyway, you um, how it relates to the um, extraordinary vessel, so many ways, I think, Treating the extraordinary vessels for old people is really, really important. I really do. Yeah. You know, you need you need the the diamond, the girdle vessel because the balance is all off. You know, you start losing your balance, and um, and also it's meant to be good for the sinews, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way I was walking on the ice today, it was like sort of me and every other old person in cardio, I noticed. Yeah. We were all walking like little mice, you know, <laughs> holding on to things on the ice, just terrified of not falling. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then uh, the, the stepping vessels, that's very important. And I think that's probably very important as well for your eyes and your sleep. <laughs> Uh, but but I mean, almost psychologically as well, it's like looking ahead. What mm. the hell is there ahead? <laughs> Bungalow hospice crematory. Yes. <laughs> so, so, you know, actually encouraging a wide vision of what the possibilities are ahead is mm. great. And the stepping vessels, you know, just going, you know, allowing us just to go there. Mm. Really important. Mm. And, and um, I've noticed, actually, the uh, yin, yin linking vessel um, is, seems to be, I seem to have loads of symptoms mm. to do with the yin linking vessel. I mean, for example, difficulty swallowing. Oh, you wouldn't think of that. Mm. Do you know about that one? 
that's a really weird thing. I sort of feel like there's a little ledge at the back of my tongue and things get stuck on it. Oh, that's it. Yeah, no, I've, I've actually not heard anybody talk about that. I mean, that's partly why I wanted you to talk about it as well, because I think there's been a lot, like you say, written more about ageing, a bit glamorising it. And and I love the way you talk about, it's kind of meant to be a struggle in a way because there it's aren't any other gateways. Because we're only, the, the last gateway, the menopause, I often say to people that that's actually only halfway through our lives. So if you think that the ancient Chinese would think our natural cycle of life was 100 years, and on average we're 50 when we go through the menopause, well, there's still like maybe another 50 years, perhaps, maybe not as long as that now. So it's like we're, we're kind of left more on our own, aren't we? It's like we talked about the menstrual cycle earlier and women are really tied to that monthly cycle. And then after the menopause, it's like, I remember someone saying to me, it's like now you have to work out your own cycle. You're not tied to this monthly cycle and it can be anything. And it's quite, it can be quite um, scary in a way. Like you say, like, well, what I've got all this ex other time. What am I going to do with it? I, I mean, I was going to ask you because I mean, you in modern society, in ancient societies, there wasn't really the concept of retirement and people would carry on doing things pretty much until the end well, they had to talk about right at the end sorry they had to to live didn't they but i think the purpose of being old i mean i this came to me recently as a much older mother with a rather commitment phobic son and mm. no other um, offspring i'm quite unlikely to have grandchildren or at least not until i'm nearly 100 I should think <laughs> I do think that grandchildren are really important because uh, whenever any of my friends have a grandchild I think oh well bye <laughs> see you again in a few years time because they sort of like fall in love mm. with their grandchildren and it's like it's appropriate because that's you know the children go forward and you watch them grow and you just re-experience it all again and the beauty of it so I don't have grandchildren, but hey, you know, there's other things. Yeah, there's other Thank things. You. I think that's actually an important point that, in fact, and I, I mean, the turning points, I, I call them turning points now, and that's what my whole new book is about, is how when we have grandchildren, if we have grandchildren, well, in a way, when we when we have children, we're we're re going through those those gateways ourselves as they go through them, aren't we? And when we have grandchildren, then we're re it's an opportunity to re go through those gateways as the grandmother. So we we re experience birth, we re experience pregnancy uh, one step removed. And you you said oh for women uh, only women have these gateways. I'm coming around to the fact that actually they are gateways for men. They're just not as tangible as for women because men are going through a whole process of transformation when their partner becomes pregnant, when they have a baby, when they have a child. They are experiencing some of that, you know, in a different way, but it still affects them. It's still a gateway for them, I feel, as well. But it's interesting when you talk about ageing and being a grandparent, not, be, not being a grandparent, then you, it is a bit more of a void because there aren't those gateways going through. And I think that's going to be a thing for this generation, for for future generations of women, because so many women are having their children when they're much older. And so then if their children continue that, then they, they're probably not going to have much of an experience with their grandchildren. And I agree with you about when I I have some friends now that are starting to have grandchildren as well. And, and it's, it's very tangible that they do fall in love. It's like being a mother. Well, it's the grandmother. So you're still going through that phase of, falling in with the baby, falling in love with the baby, all your energy and a lot of your focus and energy and time goes into this new new life. So it is about being mothering again. And yeah. so I can see if you don't have grandchildren and friends of yours do, you know, it's it's a bit harder to find what your role is. Yes, mm. it is. But, you know, hey, hey, it's okay. Yeah, it's another it's another it's another struggle to evolve a spiritual quality from. Yeah, we have to we each have our different journeys. I mean, some people don't have a lot and, and increasing numbers of people are not having children at all. So they're not certainly not going to 
grandchildren if they don't have children. Yeah. Our society is going to change a lot, I think. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to know what kinds of different kinds of approach they will need in treatment. Yes, I'm sure it will change. I mean, I, I want to ask one final thing. I think I sense we're getting maybe towards the end because, I mean, there's so much more that we could say and we could talk for hours. But when you said about the ageing process, at what stage you started to feel older? Because I know until recently you have actually still been teaching um, working a lot you didn't stop at 60 65 so I mean your work has still been and I don't probably still continues I, to I be. carried I carried on giving shiatsu and and teaching until I was 74 mm-hmm. 75 74 or 75 mm-hmm. I can't remember anymore That's and a good, um, a good age I mean and until that time did you still feel you weren't so into the phase of reflecting on I was really, I was really enjoying it still, and um, you know the uh, the energetic side of it was really in, uh, uh, involving. But what began to it was my physical being. It started to really tire me physically, and my hands started to hurt a lot, and my knees. Mm-hmm. It became more of a physical struggle. And what sort so, of age did, was that happening? I think I think from the age of seventy things started mm. getting harder. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because I'm in I'm in my early sixties, so I've still that that's why I'm, that's why I wanted to talk to you about this to hear you know <laughs> because I don't know I sometimes I think oh I maybe I'll carry on teaching till I'm eighty but again it's like with everything isn't it we all age differently it depends on on our whole life history it depends on what we're meant to be doing with our life I've, I've met yesterday I live in France and I had a session with a healer who's here who's actually worked with Elizabeth Rochard de la Vallée who's a very important French acupuncturist and this woman's about 82 and and what she does with her work isn't as physical as shiatsu because shiatsu giving shiatsu is quite a physical discipline isn't it especially if we work on the floor I mean this woman I saw yesterday in her early 80s she was working on a table and she didn't do too much physical um, work and and it did feel very on a on a more kind of spiritual less physical level and so it's interesting for me to reflect on how I I, I, I also yes I don't know how I'll be when I'm 70 or 80. Do you know, I, I, I stopped working on the floor for a while mm-hmm. um, and w- I worked on a table, but then I got so fed up with working on a table. It's so fiddly. What do you do with the arms? Because they're like hanging off the table, you know, and you want to work, use some weight on the inside of the arms, etc. cetera. And, uh, and so then I decided I was just going to do more knee exercises and get back on the futon on the floor. And it felt so good to do, honestly. I mean, just coming back to using my body weight felt mm. so wonderful. Mm. And it's not so hard. You know, your knees creak for a bit, but. Yeah. I think it's more the tiredness. And also, I think I was my own worst enemy. You know what I was, uh, what we were kind of touching on earlier about how you kind of create your own problems <laughs> as you go along. <laughs> Yeah. And um, I've I've always been a little, uh, I've demanded too much of myself in Shiatsu. I've always felt like I've got to please the person and really do every single little bit, you know, like, you know, I must do all the fingers and all the toes, mm-hmm. <laughs> every single little bit. And I don't think I allowed myself to really develop my shiatsu to the point where I was going to just relax and have a good time, you mm. know, which I think is so important. Any shiatsu practitioners out there listening, please just relax and have a good time. <laughs> don't force yourself like me. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, I think I don't might have slightly I really that. Think it helps. Yeah, I think I might have that tendency and I'm trying to do to be less um but I suppose that's maybe part of what makes us want to teach 
shiatsu and acupuncture and write books and things but that's a really good learning for me to feel yes to not to, to, to actually accept the aging process and I don't think it's easy like you say even I'm I'm at least 10 years behind you but it's I'm beginning now to accept that I'm getting older but there's still parts of me that that feel well I I, I sometimes I forget that I'm getting older which is which is, I was going to say, which is great, but maybe it isn't because it's actually really accepting the limitations of this physical body. And it's a process. And, and it, I'm sure it probably does take 30, 40, 50 years to really accept and be much more compassionate yeah. for our limits. The spirit, listen, this struggle goes on because the spirit is always going to feel youthful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is lovely in a way. You know, I still feel very much the same inside as I did when I was 12. So, yes but, but it's just that you know that 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 elan doesn't uh, you, you can't carry it through anymore mm, yeah. not so far anyway yeah yeah but the precepts of chinese medicine are still very useful eating the right food and breathing the right way and trying to keep your mind calm etc etc all of that yeah, it's a whole philosophy, isn't it, in a way of understanding, psychology, philosophy, uh, environmental, it's everything. It's a whole way of, of being that we can carry with us even into our dying process. So, and live. Yeah. How to find our way when we have no more gateways apart from the last one the last physical one, which is when we leave well, our physical body. Looking, for, looking forward to the next gateway is, I think, definitely, um, it's a path, mm. definitely. Mm -hmm. One to embrace. Yeah, yes. To embrace, to not be afraid of. Yes. Um, my friend Nicola, and probably possibly your friend Nicola as well, um, Nicola Lee, uh, mm. went to visit... Uh, a Buddhist lady who was dying and she said it was the most ex wonderful experience you know there were candles and lovely smells and etc etc and the lady who was dying said I'm looking forward to my next body mm. <laughs> so that's sweet yeah that's sweet. I, I was going to say and that's the whole thing with Chinese yeah. medicine it's like looking for that we are more than this physical body so we honor this body while we're in it but we're also ready to leave it when it's our time yeah Maybe that's a good way of ending our conversation. I'm actually, in talking about ending, I can see my camera light flashing. So I'm aware that at any moment, the screen will probably go blank because my camera <laughs> is going to run out, okay. which is quite a good image for the essence, isn't it? That at some point, it essence in this body runs out and to embrace the next life that we're going to live. Absolutely. Look yeah. forward to the next one. I'm sure you have plenty more years left, Carola, before you go into your next life and much more learning and experiencing to do. But thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been fascinating. I've really enjoyed it. And I hope that everybody listening will really enjoy it because we've, I'm aware we've maybe touched on things that you don't, that you might need more information on. But the whole point of this was to really give you a flavour of why Chinese medicine is so important and relevant today and how many issues of today's world it actually is still relevant for. Thank you. Do you Absolutely. want to say one final word or? I, I'm really bad on, on final words. Just, you know, oh. yes, it's been great fun. Yeah, great. Thank <laughs> fun you. is important. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne.